I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. My name's Colby. I'm one of the pastors here at Pillar Church. It's my privilege to be able to open the Word uh, with you for uh, the remainder of our time together. And we're going to read verses 12 through 17 of Romans 8. And then uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about our gospel story of adoption. So here's what it says in in verse 12 of chapter 8. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. Uh, And we thank you for the way that you allow us to see the testimony of your word. Uh, born out and witnessed from our brothers and sisters. Lord, I thank you for uh, Josh and Brooke and their family and uh, for the kids that they've cared for, for giving us the privilege to be a part of their lives. Lord, I pray that you would continue to fill them up with strength, that you would show your abounding love to those little girls as they uh, continue to walk through life and and experience uh, your love uh, through the unique means of... um, this family, and other situations you'll bring them into. Lord, I pray for our adoptive families and fostering families in this church. I'm thankful, God, for the example they set uh, to us, uh, for the ways that they um, carry the calling that you've put in their life, Lord, with, uh, with grace and strength for the ways that your spirit has continued to empower them. Lord, I pray for even the difficulties that we can't hear or understand that both the children who come into these situations face as well as uh, the families as they work together lord that god you would remind us uh lord that um that your grace is sufficient for even the most challenging situation lord i pray that your uh spirit would empower us to be reminded of the hope of the gospel and how it not only speaks to our promise and security, but also, Lord, empowers us, Lord, to be able to bear your image in a way that really puts your gospel on display to be seen uh, as we walk in love with one another and our neighbors. And we pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I, I, was, I was hanging out with a family that is fostering a uh, uh, a couple of little girls um, this past week, and I had an experience I've had on a number of occasions. Um, the little girl uh, wanted to keep stealing my hat, and uh, I let her, and she, and you know, she would come back, and I'd get the hat back, and she would steal the hat again, and and she just kept coming back, you know, because she wanted to get just the reaction of attention and the fun of uh, playing together. And so she kept doing it over and over and over again, like kid, little kids do, right? Once they find that thing they love to do with you, they do it until it's just a crazy amount of times. You can't imagine how they could still enjoy it. But it's really the connection that they're, that they're looking for. Well, our families were sitting around, and, and she kept wanting to show me things that she could do, and running fast, jumping off a bench, uh, and it was sweet. She, was just, she just has such a, a fun uh, little personality. After running around a little more, she sat up on the bench beside me, and she said, can I call you Dada? What I've learned from pastoring people and spending a lot of time supporting families that foster or adopt is that there is this deep human longing in our hearts to have the security, the attentiveness, the provision, and love of a father. And when it's not there, you start looking for it any ways that you really can. You go and find it. So this little girl looked up and and, uh, she asked the question. And I chuckled and I said to her, you can't call me Dada, but if you want, you can call me Bubba. And 
and she laughed, and uh, the rest of the evening she called me Bubba, and she probably the next time I see her will call me Bubba, um, and it's just, it's, a fu- it's funny because this little girl, you know, she's looking for someone to be a father, to provide that security that we know. You see, calling someone Dada or Father or Abba, as this passage uses, carries a deep, powerful connection, one that every human being longs for, that all of us desire. It's not just the powerful connection of that relationship, but it's the security, the provision, the joy, the sense of purpose and identity that comes along with it that we're often in search of. And and the Apostle Paul reaches into that longing of our human hearts, and in his effort to help us understand the genuine security and hope that we find in a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, he says that we have been adopted, and the Spirit of God testifies within us that we can call God Abba, Father, Dada. Well, my main point this morning, as we look at this text and we think about this topic, is is to show us that adoption is a promise and picture of gospel hope. That adoption is a promise of gospel hope for us, and it is a picture of gospel hope that we can demonstrate together. Adoption is a promise and a picture of of gospel hope. And I want to tell you what I'm up to this morning right up front, what I hope to accomplish. I think it may put you at ease a little as well as prepare you to rejoice in Christ and be an advocate for vulnerable children that need a home. Listen, adoption and foster care is far too serious of a venture for me to use guilt to flippantly tell all of you to just go do it. I myself have not adopted or fostered. But I also want us to see that that adoption and foster care is far too important of a picture for us to neglect thinking deeply how as a Christian we can display the gospel together for vulnerable children in our world. Our founding pastor here at Pillar Church had a family motto that said, what we do, we do together. And when, one of the things that we need to understand is when we're talking about adoption and foster care at Pillar Church, we're not talking just individualistically about what you as an individual need to do in response to God or the ways you may need to respond today to what God would say to you on this topic. We are talking about this as a family, as a gospel family of people gathered together saying, what kind of culture together do we want to build when it comes to the question of vulnerable children and so you may not individually find yourself on the front lines of being an adoptive parent or a fostering family but we together as a church want to be a people that care for vulnerable children and that means some of us will be on the front lines and other of us will be holding the rope as other people do that work and will serve as advocates but what we do we do together And so today, we're not just speaking to you as an individual. We're aspiring to be a culture, a gospel family, with a particular type of culture that abounds in our lives, where every child is loved and cared for and has a home. And so adoption is a promise of that, and it matters for all of us because it is one of the ways that we can reflect and display God's heart together. And I hope you'll just lean in and think about this deeply because of the two points that we'll look at here. As we've said already, there are many ways for us to be involved collectively that allow for you to wrestle with how you can be involved individually. But the reason we want you to do it, the reason we want you to think about that is first and foremost because the gospel is an adoption story. Because the gospel is is an adoption story. Let me give you kind of a background of the use of this imagery about salvation in the Bible. The Bible uses a whole host 
of imagery to try to help us understand the salvation and rescue that is offered to us through faith in Jesus Christ. It uses legal language to tell us that we can be declared not guilty of our sin and no longer be under the condemnation of the law. And so when it talks about our salvation and relationship with God, sometimes it uses legal language to say that you are not guilty, no longer condemned, and before the court that you are pardoned and forgiven. And we often hear that, and it, and it, and it arrests us and, and frees our hearts from fears of being guilty before God. It uses power language, the Bible does at times, that says in the gospel that although we have been deceived and captured by an enemy more powerful than us that plays on our weakness, we can call out to Jesus Christ and he will rescue us and bring us out of danger to the safety of his protection. The gospel gives us that kind of hope in the power of Jesus to deliver on his promise. The, Bi the Bible uses rescue language to talk about our salvation, to describe that through sin we have lost our way and found ourselves alienated from God. We found ourselves separated from his good purposes and God seeks us out and offers to lead us home if we will call on him and repent of the sin that got us there. So we hear legal language, we hear power language, we hear rescue language. The Bible uses health language to describe our salvation. We have been diseased with the effects of sin. We are sick to our core with disordered desires and, and, and we are overcome by this disease. But through faith in Christ, we can be cured. We can experience genuine spiritual healing that cures us of the disease and removes the fear that it will destroy us. So for the guilty, there's the promise in salvation of forgiveness. For the person in bondage, there's a promise of freedom. For the person who feels lost, there's a promise of being found. For the person who feels, who is sick with sin, there's a promise to be healed. Now one of the most powerful images that expresses the hope of the gospel and does so by describing something that is substantively true about us and not just theoretically true, is the language that we find here that tells us that God's salvation for us is a work of adoption. It's a work of adoption. We are an adopted people. In that work of God, adoption... We find out this is how, how we explain and understand the dynamics of God's saving work on our behalf that he has adopted us. He's adopted us. In that work of adoption, God takes someone who is spiritually and relationally has no legal or familial right of association with him. And he gives them the status of sonship in his family. This is what salvation accomplishes for us. Now at the core, we're talking today about what is in scripture called the doctrine of adoption. God's adopting work in salvation. The doctrine of adoption is what tells us that God's salvation is relational and personal not just legal and theoretical. That means God saves us individually and for a real relationship with Him. Think about it. Justification by faith, another core doctrine and picture of the gospel's work of salvation tells us that we are pardoned for our past sins and declared righteous in God's sight. And it's a beautiful thing. The guilt of our sin can be gone. We can be free from it. I don't know if you've ever seen this like kind of trope in a movie where um, somebody has like served their time in prison. Uh, they, they've paid their debt to society, so to speak. And there's so many movies that kind of start off this way. And somebody's like getting their clothes back. And uh, they're walking out the door of whatever incarceration facility that they've been in. And 
they walk out the door, and they're just standing there. I mean, there's nobody there to greet them. And there, it, it, like, always f- creates this tension in a movie or in a show, like, what do I do now? I may be free from the past, but how do I build a life from here? And see, justification by faith, it, it tells us this really, really great thing that, that we didn't even have to serve the time, but that Jesus paid our debt for our past sin and that we've been free of any condemnation or guilt that is there. Uh, but, but, you know, have you ever thought about what it would mean if God just declared us free from our past sin, but then just left us in life to figure out the way forward? I mean, it's, it's great to be forgiven and to be pardoned. But, but here in the gospel, we imagine that in that moment where we needed forgiveness and pardon, we not only got a judge that declared us free, the doctrine of adoption tells us that we gained a father who took us home and said, I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you figure out how to get your feet on the ground and to walk like a member of your family. The guilt of our sin can be gone. We can be free from it. But doctrinally, justification by faith on its, on its own leaves us free of past guilt, but alone in the world to go forward ourselves. But the Bible, through passages like this, tells us that there is so much more to our salvation, so much more to the story. Notice in the passage the two possible conditions. A past fear of whether our performance would gain us acceptance that he describes as being in the flesh, a sort of slavery, it is called, where in that relationship we are fatherless and we're trying to earn the approval of God. And then he contrasts that here with what is true in salvation, a new condition of being adopted in in the family of a loving and gracious father. Not only does God declare us pardoned and forgiven through Jesus Christ, this passage tells us that he fundamentally changes our relationship to him. And salvation is not merely a legal transaction of pardon. It is a permanent relational welcome to having God as our loving father father with a security that removes the fear of abandonment god adopts us and guarantees for us a new future that's what he does and he becomes to us a loving father that brings us on to experience the fullness of new life in his family uh, a couple years ago my kids um were in a small uh car accident All of them were in the car, and actually Moses Clifton was there as well. It was a Kia Soul, and it had five people in it. So if you got to just imagine a tin can stuffed full of people, and a deer, a deer ran straight into the side of it and blew all the airbags. And, um, you know, the first thing that happens, you know, when your teenage daughter calls you to let her know that, let you know that uh, she's been in a car wreck, is that she's a little bit thinking, oh no, am I in trouble? Did I do something wrong about this? So um, in this situation, of course, it was obvious that it's not the case, but it's still always a little bit of the, the first thing you think. Maybe I did something wrong. What's wrong? And I, I've got to call and, and do that. And you can imagine a, a child being a little bit fearful about that. So just imagine what kind of father we would, we would imagine that I was if when she called, I said to her, oh, don't worry about it. You're not in trouble. I just wanted to let you know. And then I hung up. That would be really odd to do, wouldn't it? Uh, You know, it's great to know that whatever experience happened in the past or whatever has brought you to that point is, you know, that you're not in trouble, that you're not under any condemnation or found at fault. But what you want to know is, is there anybody that's with me? And and so, of course, I did what a normal dad would do. I said, stay there. I'll be right there. And they didn't know what to do really next in the situation. I drove over there and we figured it out together. And I just remember Haley's relief as I arrived because she was trying to figure out what do I do with these kids and Moses and uh, trying to just make sure everybody is all right. What they needed, what she needed was a father to show up. 
And, and I think this is, is part of why we're given this picture of adoption in the gospel to, to tell us that in Christ we get more than just forgiveness and pardon of the past, but we get a father and adoption into a family where through his spirit he abides with us and brings us on to fully experience the redemption that is in Christ. And, and part of what I want to say to you today is that if you are a Christian here today, let me tell you your adoption story. Listen in so that you can hear that this this is not just a story about salvation. This is our story. If you're a Christian, this is your story. If you're a Christian here today, let me tell you, tell you your adoption story. First, at birth, you were born into a human family alienated from God. By nature, every human being shares in the sinful separation from God that began with Adam. Your human parents can do nothing to make you right with God on their own power. You were born alienated from God. No claim to be a part of his family. Then by thought, word, and deed, you sinned against the holy law of God and accrued a debt of justice that you could not pay. The law of God that displays God's holy purpose and pure righteousness also makes us deeply aware that we have fallen short of the glory of God. The law of God rightly condemns us. It condemns us as guilty of actual sin and deserving of just punishment and retribution before God and His righteousness. Third, every effort at righteousness and goodness that you ever made could not provide security that you were right with God. Knowing of our sin and having it revealed through the righteousness of God's law show, shows us that we don't have the security and promise of being in God's presence and on right terms with Him. In fact, it is a fearful life of effort with little promise. If I'm going to be right with God, how will I ever know when I'm good enough and feel secure that I belong to Him? So in our story, every effort at righteousness and goodness that we have done could not provide security that we were right with God. Fourth, when you could do nothing for yourself, God sent His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to pay the debt of your sin. Jesus reconciled the debt of justice that you owed by paying with his own death for your sins on the cross. He made the arrangement for your debts to be paid and freed you from the accusations of your past decisions and associations. And he did all of that before you even knew that he was doing it. Number five, then... By the Spirit of God, God came and found you where you were to claim you as His own. Do you remember where you were when God found you? I mean, can you remember how God worked in your life to bring you to a place of genuine salvation? He began by His Spirit to awaken you to the fact that you were separated from Him. He began to give you a sense of the seriousness of your sin and your condition without Him. You began to feel the weight of it and you called out to God to save you and rescue you. And get this, He had already made all of the arrangements. For you to be saved. You discovered that through Christ, all the work had already been done for God to save and rescue you. And you believed. You had faith. And you were saved. And here's the part that Paul tells us here. In that moment, he gave you his spirit to dwell within you that testifies that you can call God Father. That you can call God Father. You see, the death of Jesus atones for the sin that separated you from God. And Jesus' death is a sacrifice of a new covenant relationship where God dwells within you by the power of His Holy Spirit. The presence of His Holy Spirit the Bible says that the giving of the Spirit is, is called a new birth that makes you alive to God and in a new relationship to Him. The, the, what you could not gain by your 
initial birth, you now gain because the Spirit of God gives you new life. It's so powerful that Jesus describes it to Nicodemus as being born all over again. But that is a powerful technical promise for this passage because through that new birth, you also gain a new relationship with God that is produced by His Holy Spirit, which sets you aside as belonging to His family. And that Holy Spirit that is given to you gives you belonging to a new family relationship with God. And this passage tells us, testifies deep within you that you are not a slave to a law, but a child that belongs to a father. And so if you have believed the gospel and you haven't gone from seeing yourself as a slave to doing what God commands to becoming to seeing yourself as a child who's welcomed into his family and being trained and cared for to experience all the future that God has promised to you you haven't yet grasped this promise that you have been adopted and you've gone from servant to son in the house of God in fact God invites you to call him father Abba. And with that new invitation comes all the promises of the best version of a father we could ever imagine. Everything that would come with it. The security to never be abandoned. The guidance and wisdom that we don't have for ourselves. An ability to help us navigate the future. A provision that we can't give to ourselves. And an inheritance of all that he has for us to enjoy and walk in. And he says, call me Father. Call me Abba. See, He has granted you sonship in the promise of sharing in Christ's inheritance. You not only have the security of God's presence for this life, but are guaranteed to share in eternal life in the renewing of all creation in which God at the end of time will make all things new and put them under the lordship and ownership of Jesus Christ and grant the riches of his grace to his co-heirs. And if you see in this passage, it says that we, by his spirit, become those co-heirs because we've been adopted into his family so whether male or female this passage tells us we're granted the status of sonship so here sonship isn't just for males in God's family sonship is a status for male and female alike taking the picture from the ancient world of those who would inherit the father's riches and saying it's for all of us who have put in our put our faith in Christ we get the inheritance of a son and it says we get that inheritance Not as like secondary or third in line leftovers, but as co-heirs with Christ. (laughs) That Jesus, in giving his life, he poured out himself so that he could gather us into a family where we would get the standing and privileges that he himself deserves. And that only he himself truly deserves has owned. This is the good news. <laughs> this is the gospel that we celebrate. He didn't just bring us into the family. He wrote us into the will. And so what this passage tells us and wants you to know is that your security in that relationship comes from Jesus declaring that there is no past condemnation, which is in 8 chapter one, eight, chapter 8, verse 1, that his cross has not covered. That there is no condemnation that remains for those who are in Christ Jesus. And then the Spirit declaring to you that you've been adopted by your heavenly Father. Paul makes our security clear if you reason with him along. 
in the flesh or in our natural state, we seek security from past condemnation by trying to become righteous by the works of the law. There is no security in becoming righteous by the works of the law. It only shows us how much we need Christ. In the flesh, we also continue to try to find present security by our performance and progress in works of the law. Both are described as a sort of slavery, one that we were in and one that we're told here not to fall back into. Because we've been given a spirit, not of bondage to a former slavery where we earn God's favor, but we've been given the spirit of adoption as sons where he says, you are mine, secure in him. Apart from our own works. That the gospel says, come in like an adopted child. And the Father will bring you on to maturity of patience, kindness, and joy in a relationship that isn't characterized by fear. I wonder if you've believed this good news. For some of you today, the adoption that you most need to believe in is the one that God has given you. In Christ Jesus. Listen, we will never have a spirit of adoption as a church that loves to give vulnerable children a home until we see that we were the vulnerable children that God sought out and secured forever into his family. In the spirit, we're united to Christ's gospel by faith and no longer under condemnation from our failure to keep the law. We, presently, we are presently secure as children of God, which the Spirit witnesses to. Then and only then, with this security in hand, through faith in Christ, are we able to go on and learn to put to death the deeds of the flesh and grow into the identity we've been given. The law and our works are worthless without the gospel, this good news. The law become, but then the law becomes a meaningful vision when the gospel has secured us. And once it's secured us, it can bring us on to maturity and show us, but from that security, not for that security. Adoption is God's work to give you a status in his family that did, we did not have by birth, could not earn by works, but rest secure in because we believe the promise of Jesus Christ. We belong to God. He loves us, and it is his will to grant us the riches of his grace for all eternity. So the gospel is an adoption story, and because of that, and as we close, adoptions tell a gospel story. Adoptions tell a gospel story. Adoption is not the gospel in and of itself. The gospel does not obligate Christians to adopt children. The gospel actually doesn't work that way through these types of obligations, the gospel moves us at the core of who we are to imitate God in a whole variety of ways that honor him because we now belong to his family. And since God is an adopting God, we image him, we put him on display by being an adopting people as we take on more and more of his likeness. That is true of many other qualities and many other things that God assigns us to care about. And so we see this image-bearing in uh, one point in the heart of King David in the Old Testament. If you don't know the story, David became king after the failure of King Saul to honor God. David had been very close friends with King, Saul, uh, King Saul's son, Jonathan, but eventually, because of the hatred of King Saul for David, they were separated from that friendship, and Jonathan eventually died in battle. Later, David becomes king, and it was customary in the ancient world for a king to kill the descendants of any previous regime. But David doesn't do that. In 2 Samuel 9, we get this really interesting story about King David. After David takes the throne, he asks if there are any descendants remaining from King Saul, particularly because they would be descendants of Jonathan. So he's told Mephibosheth is alive and asks him to be brought there to his house. And here is what happens. Mephibosheth thinks he is being summoned for death and comes in fear like a servant. 
He is actually disabled in the feet and it says he's unable to work. And when he arrives, David has brought him in there to do good to him because of Jonathan. We are told that because of David's love for Jonathan, he, makes, he takes Mephibosheth into his own home. He declares that every day thereafter, Mephibosheth will eat at his own table with him. It says in 2 Samuel 9, 11, that Mephibosheth ate at the table like one of David's own sons. David took the land that had originally belonged to Saul and his family, and despite Saul having lost right to it through battle and poor decisions, he gave it back to Mephibosheth and had workers work the land that he might prosper. And this story is a beautiful picture of David using his table, using his home, and his authority to give the blessing of God to someone who otherwise would not have experienced it. Now the reason it's in Scripture is because in it, David shows off the image of God which he bears, and he bears witness through it to the grace of God as he uses his table, his home, and his power for someone that wasn't his son by birth. The reason it's in Scripture is because of that. In adopting and caring for people who would otherwise have no connection, that we would otherwise have no connection to through foster care and other avenues provides a unique opportunity for us to display and experience the joy of God's costly love. Love is always costly. And the Spirit of God in this time and moment until we reach our inheritance, does what this passage in Romans 8 tells us is in line with someone who's been secured by the Spirit of God. It calls us and prepares us for costly, sacrificial love. Love that suffers with people. That love that bears the effects of the curse and the fall that we walk under so other people can prosper it calls us to display costly love that joins Jesus in his sufferings to bring the practical fruit of God's redemption into the lives of those who aren't yet experiencing it. And so as we come to the table, I want us to think about that picture, Mephibosheth. As we've been welcomed into God's family with no claim on his love and righteousness and belonging, he has lavishly said, I'll give everything that they need. And we are celebrating together that that included the death of his only begotten son. Jesus' death for our gain, his body broken so that we could be brought into a family that's whole. His blood shed so that we could have a covenant with a real relationship with God. And if that's your testimony, we invite you to join us in taking the bread and the cup as we continue to worship. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for this time and pray that as we celebrate the bread and the cup and as we bring this time to a close, that you, Lord, you would grant us wisdom and understanding. Lord, I pray that you would cause us to be moved to imitate you and to celebrate that we're welcome at your table. In Jesus' name, amen.